Okay, guys, hockey season is upon us. We got a little art imitating life. Just happened recently. The United States beat Canada in the World Juniors. And so we're going to talk about basically the same thing happening in film. We're talking about 1994's D2, The Mighty Ducks. So, Kristen, how excited are you to talk about this movie? This, this is patriotism, baby. This is a very important match against, let me just look up who the rival was, uh, Iceland. Any chance I have to talk about the Ducks, I'm in. Oh, you're so cheap. So you're so super cheesy. Let's do this, <laughs> let's do this hockey. Let's get it. A hockey movie that has an alley-oop in it. We're talking D2 next on The Real MVP. <laughs> Well, guys, it's a new year and another episode of The Real MVP. And we are here because, oddly, this year is starting like it never has before. It's hockey season. Do you guys want to talk about hockey? Senior VP, Hendricks Hockey Apparel. What exactly is it that you want, Mr. Tribbles? I want you, Gordon. Kristen, Saul? <laughs> I got my beanie you... on. I'm ready for hockey. I think I'm just yeah. really ready to continue on past 2020. So anything new, bring it on. I'm always icy, so let's do it. <laughs> it's perfect for your cold heart. Now, for those of you just listening to this, I have dressed the part. I am wearing an Arizona Coyotes sweater jersey for you uh, uninitiated, but it's a hockey sweater. And one of the reasons we're talking about D2, the Mighty Duck sequel from 1994, is, of course, the NHL season is upon us. Uh, for those of you local, Fox Sports Arizona is going to show 54 of the 56 scheduled Arizona Coyotes games on Shameless our air. Plug. Shameless plug. <laughs> Ding. But today we're here to talk about just the feel good, just, you know, patriotic, Disney-fied version, although oddly violent for a kid's hockey sport. We're here to talk about D2, the Mighty Ducks. Saul. We, we we, I don't know if you have history with this movie. This came out when we were teenagers, but you told me when you watched it, you had pages of notes. Why do you have pages of notes about D two? Man, it's Disney. It's it's the Ducks. It's pretty pretty straightforward. Bad guys lose, good guys win. Do they though? Do they? I mean, there's just there's so much to unpack in this movie. First of all, it's the ice version of the Sandlot. Number one. And they use people from the Sandlot. It's like two characters, the Nunez and and Benny the Jet. So there's that. Uh, and then you just have the whole like, there's so much racial profiling in this movie. <laughs> it's just like there's a lot of things to unpack in this episode. Talks about hockey for five minutes. Gets for, into racial like, profiling. If that, <laughs> if that. Oh, and now we're just hiring random ass peewee head coaches to be the face of some sponsorship nationally. Like what? You just gave hope to all those AAU coaches that are destroying the youth of, of sports out there. It's never going to happen. I don't you even are. know of a real AAU coach that's actually been the face of a franchise ever. You are a murderer of dreams. Do you know that? <laughs> hey, I'm just telling it like it is. Just little kids fulfilling every other kid's dream of being on Team USA at age no. 13. Do they so actually... Do they actually show the Junior Goodwill games on TV? We I'm talk about this on this that. podcast all the time. There are way too many things televised with play-by-play -play announcers. I will be banging that drum until the day I die. But I have, I have yeah. that in my list. <laughs> yeah, the, the Junior Goodwill games definitely seem like a big national event that uh, I'm not sure exists. So you thought it was uh, very sandlotty. This, of course... Comes out in 1994. A lot of kids' sports movies uh, around that time. Rookie of the Year, Sandlot. Um, you know, obviously the Mighty Ducks. The first one comes out. So this is prime time for sports movies. It's written by Stephen Brill. He was uh, he was roommates with Peter Berg, who's famous for a lot of things, directing and acting. I love him from Friday Night Lights as the director of Friday Night Lights. But they were roommates. And Stephen Brill uh, wrote the original Mighty Ducks because he actually wanted to make a hockey version of um, the Bears. The, what, what am I talking about? The Bad News Bears. Bad News Bears, yeah. <laughs> which we will definitely be doing 
either the newer or older version on the real MVP. It's got to be the older version because the newer version was whack. (laughs) So first thing I want to ask you guys about this, you know, this this movie fulfills, you know, we're, we're talking about the sequel. We're diving right into the Mighty Ducks, you know, cinematic universe. So I, I don't know if we have to catch everybody up on the first one. I'm assuming people who have listened to this know that it starts with Gordon Bombay. He obviously led the P, to the Pee Wee Championship, and it then he got a shot. He got his shot. The first one ends with him going off to play minor league hockey with the Waves. His career ends early on in this with an injury. But it got me thinking – you know, and that, that was his dream. And that's where we start right there. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. But I want to know what your, did you guys have a childhood dream? Did, like Gordon Bombay wanted to play in the league. You know, that was his, he ended up a lawyer, a really successful lawyer, but he wanted to be a hockey player. Did you guys want to be pro athletes when you were kids? Kristen, you must, uh, you, what was your dream? It is funny that you say, did you want to be pro athletes? Because I think every kid has that dream of being an athlete because it's a, that's the one thing they can relate to at that age is sports. Like, or you either come up with astronaut or something, but you like, realistically, no one is becoming astronaut. So yeah, you have a better chance of, I was a swimmer. I'm going to, I'm going to the Olympics. I'm going to be an Olympic swimmer. That's funny that you should say that because I literally wanted to go to space. I yeah. wanted to go to space, but I also wanted to be the quarterback of the 49ers one time because the, the, <laughs> the, the 49ers were like big and I, I was a big Joe Montana fan and the Cardinals were awful at the time. And so uh, growing up as a kid, you know, I loved Walter Payton. I was like, oh, man, it'd be so awesome to to play football in the National Football League. And uh, then I decided to not play football in high school. And I just play basketball. So who knows? But I don't get the same feeling that Josh had that dream of becoming a pro athlete. Uh, he played with Mike Bibby. Of course he had that dream. <laughs> I, I basically, yeah, I, I, I pretty much would have been like, I probably wanted to be an agent. I know we've already talked about Jerry Maguire, but I was like, whatever the nerd. Once I got into sports and I was a late bloomer, some might say I'm still waiting to bloom. But uh, I, I definitely was like into the nerdier end. Like by age 10, I knew I wanted to work in sports television. But like I was trying to think what I wanted to be when I was a little kid. I think astronaut was on my list, but when I was seven years old, the Challenger uh, accident happened, and then I, that got scratched off my list and a lot of people's lists right away. And uh, I, maybe I actually think the timing of this is interesting. I think like most little kids, I thought it would be cool to be president, but I don't I had no political aspirations or anything. I just thought, you know, that seemed like a cool job. Ronald Reagan was on TV all the time when I was a kid. So if I knew what I know now, back when I was eight years old, I absolutely would have tried to be president. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. If it was like anybody can be president now, hell That's yeah. That's what they tell you in first grade. No, I know, but you don't really believe it, especially me. I'm, so Josh, so, you actually fulfilled your childhood dream because you are working in sports. That's I'm doing this with, with you guys right now. This is True. wish fulfillment. So <laughs> it was really creating this podcast. It was a lifelong dream. <laughs> I mean, really, it's it's combining like my this is the perfect hybrid of my nerd and sports brain. So I appreciate that very much. <laughs> uh, let's let's talk about you. We, we talk about the beginning of the movie, these sort of very Disney fied flashbacks, the glowing video the slow-mo, the talking to his dad. We're, we're sort of moving forward into cliche hell, but uh, Saul, early on, you're watching this movie. I mean, I, there's one thing I want to talk about, but first of all, you, you were talking about early on what you noticed in it. What were you noticing? What, what kind of knee injury or leg injury did my man have where everything just came to a screeching halt? Like, we're not going to go to rehab to try. Like, if you just tore your ACL, man up. I mean, oh my gosh. Like that's a that's a six to eight month injury. You come back on the ice and like what 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 is going on here? Like that's I felt like, like I think Joe Theismann. I think that was like LT taking out Joe Theismann. I guess, but dang, that was that was kind of horrific. He's on a cane and everything, and I'm like, what what? Because yeah. isn't that the the stereotypical way for a minor leaguer's career to end? Like you already were thinking that you weren't really gonna get there, and then the injury just pushed you over the edge. That seals the deal, right? I guess, but he's even like, I don't know if he gave up completely on the dream. Well, I don't think he did either, but he just had divine intervention that this guy just stumbles into dad's shop and wants to hire him for team. You guys haven't had those conversations yet. Yeah, It's never happened. I remember when I tore my ACL, I didn't have that option. I had to join the military. So it wasn't exactly the same thing. 
But this is definitely like a classist movie because dude was an attorney. So I think like he didn't really have the ambition to be a true minor leaguer, like riding on those bus rides because he was like a very successful attorney. So obviously he's going to return to that former, more comfortable life. You know, he's like Tebow. Tebow doesn't really need to be a baseball player. So it's kind of like his hobby. But when it's said and done, you know, Tebow's going to go do, you know, media and all his other his other causes. So I mean, Gordon Mombay and Tim Tebow, I just lumped those two together. I just want that known that pretty boy. Like the same guy. Who knew that uh, being a peewee hockey coach could be such a lucrative endeavor? I had no idea. Oh, yeah. You get that oceanfront condo in Malibu? Oh, I yeah. mean, what? <laughs> Yo, I chose the wrong career field. Yeah. should have lived in Minnesota. So this movie, this movie does something. I want to talk about Gordon Bombay for a second, uh, attorney and Pee Wee coach legend. But this movie does something that, like not even Rocky does. The first thing you see in giant letters when this movie comes on after the Disney animation is two words that only really made sense. I think if you grew up in the eighties, said Emilio Estevez, <laughs> like before the name of the movie, before anything else, like. Saul, did that get you hyped? Did that bring you back to like Young Guns, uh, <laughs> Breakfast Club, The Men Outsiders? At Men at Work? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't even think about that, actually. I didn't even, until you pointed out just now, I didn't even know that that happened. I might have looked down at my phone or something. But uh, yeah, I just didn't see that. Chris, do you have any, any thoughts on Emilio Estevez whatsoever? No, you said that, and my first thought was... Are that's you jealous because his eyes are bluer than yours? No, I was thinking that's a hockey player's name. I was like, <laughs> uh, well, clearly he's from Miami because that's where all the Hispanics come from to play hockey <laughs> in this movie. So Emilio Estevez has like a very, you know, a very respectable like 80s run. A lot of like famous 80s movies. I think Young Guns of him, that's what I think of. But obviously the brother, Charlie Sheen, their dad is Martin Sheen. This is a Chavez y Chavez. There we go. Yeah, this, this is like a Hollywood royalty family. D2, kind of the end of the, Est I don't know, what would you call a renaissance of the Emilio Estevance? Like, pretty much the end of it. He does like a casual appearance in D3, and then his IMDb goes uh, pretty downhill. He had a cameo, an uncredited cameo in Mission Impossible. He dies in like the first few minutes, if I recall correctly. But other than that, like we don't really hear from Emilio for a long time, except for different parts on TV, but we're going to get back to Mighty Ducks Back from the Dead. We're going to get into that a little bit later. So a couple, a couple of other things that I noticed early on in this, you know, we always talk about, we do a lot of 90s movies. Is this, I'm going to make a word up. Is this the roller bladiest movie you've ever seen? Oh, we got to talk about that. I mean, the first thing I thought of when I watched the rollerblading scene, right, is, man, how far did they rollerblade? And there's actually a site out there that uh, you can go to that tells you exactly how far they would have rollerbladed. It was 43 miles, 43 miles of rollerblading to go grab everybody to, to come join Team USA. It's the most ridiculous thing ever. Also, you, forgive my exactly. forgive my ignorance on this topic or maybe the sport, but is rollerblading even a way that hockey trains? I don't think so. I, I, I've never heard that like, oh, we're going to go for some off-season hockey or hop on our blade. I, I would guess in Minnesota, the hotbed where the original Ducks were from, that, that in the summer, they make Minneapolis. I have not been to Minneapolis, but by God, I'm going to go there just to go yeah. to the – the Mall of America, by the way, one of the famous shots from early in this movie where they are doing, I did not know it was 43 miles. I find that amazing. <laughs> but uh, they're in the Mall of America, which is brand new. And if you were a kid in the 90s, like I think going to the Mall of America was definitely like on everybody's bucket list. Like, oh, there's a roller coaster inside a mall. That's all I know. I mean, it still exists, right? I think all that stuff is still there. Oh, but. It's, still, it's still open. From the Mall of America to that park that they went to is like 12 miles. <laughs> such a long road and 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 at the end these kids look like they hadn't even rollerbladed for five minutes they were all refreshed and yeah let's go and i'm like man at mile two i'd have been like dude this is way too long i'm out well that's why you were not on team usa 
That's yeah, right. And why I you weren't? A, yeah, they're Pee Wee champs. I mean, it was like a that was a breeze for them. It's just like no pun intended, a blade in the park for them. A stroll. Oh my god! Battleofcali.com is where you can find out that information. By the way, <laughs> I love that my use of stupid internet research appears to be rubbing off on you. I have never felt more proud than I do. I, in this I want. I wanted to make sure I was prepared for you today, Josh. <laughs> We got we got a lot of things to get into. Let's first of all, let's talk about let's go a little bit back more into Emilio. Are we sure that we're supposed to be rooting for Gordon Bombay? Is Gordon Bombay the good guy in the Mighty Ducks? I first of all, like Iceland as the bad guy, I'm not totally in on. I know it was supposed to be like an in joke because all the other movies are against Russia and they just pick like some random ass country, but like Iceland's nice. Like people from Iceland are nice. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and the trainer, the, the babe trainer, she was so nice. Yeah. I don't know how all of a sudden she was an evil person. Yeah, she, like, she, It wasn't like she was getting insider secrets or anything. Like she wasn't scouting their practices and she wasn't asking him questions. She just went on a date and grabbed some ice cream. Right. And I for all we know, you know, to your point, Josh, coach Bombay may have asked her, her to ice cream right like like yeah. he was speaking out to sleep with the enemy and, so screw those kids, and screw those kids for judging him like oh you went out with the iceland coach like have you seen her back off when you get so, to my age you'll understand little kids but yes i, I definitely are getting some like rocky four vibes you know just with the with the russians and i'm like okay i guess we yeah we can pick the russians yet again so we picked another random team but yeah i, I didn't hate the icelandic team at all no, they're like mostly guilty of being handsome. Like they have like good hair and they're like big muscles. So I was, yeah, exactly. So Gordon Mabake, like clearly a capitalist in this, like the most of the first half of the movie, it definitely has a good story arc. Like I think the idea is he's supposed to find his way back to his love of coaching, but obviously he sells out. He takes the endorsement deals. Um, but it you know, he's, it they don't, tr they don't try hard to sell that. It's just like, want to coach? He's like, well, I don't know. And he's like, well, I think you do. Okay. <laughs> it's not like, you know, he's watching kids out on the ice and he's like coaching them up. And then he's like, you know what? I really do love coaching. It's just point A, point B, done. Right. Like shame on Disney. This was the most ragtag national team I've ever heard of in my life. <laughs> They're all ragtag. Come on now. So my a couple of beefs I have with him, I want to add on to that is that you know, like sometimes you go, they don't do this as much now, I think, but you know, you'd go to like a professional game and they'd show a clip from a movie to get the crowd fired up. You know, they'd show Herb Brooks's speech from Miracle or, you know, the, uh, I think Hoosiers, like the slow clap building into the full clap. So I think it would be hilarious if a team was getting killed and they showed part of Gordon's post-game speech after they lose 12 to 1 to Iceland, which is the most depressing post-game speech I've ever seen in a movie. <laughs> He's talking to kids. And I mean, I think like the parent of me was like, Jesus, what is this guy's problem? Did, am I alone in thinking that? I didn't feel like he was that bad. He wasn't like cussing the kids out. I don't know. I didn't no, it didn't it didn't really rub me either way yeah i just thought it was a bad speech i mean if your team you get your team to the nationals and you lose 12-1 and if you watch it not a whole lot of coaching i think that's by design you know because gordon bombay's got his eyes on the the beachfront condo the hot iceland chick you know i, I think that's by design but i just thought very bad coaching job so i, I don't know yeah he was just I, I think the kids are definitely the good guys and I'm not sure I'm supposed to root for like if they had fired Gordon Bombay halfway through the movie, would anybody be like, dude, bring that guy back. Like we love it. I mean, again, his name's at the title. Emilio Estevez, the first thing you see. And I was like, I don't care about this dude. Get lost. Get bent. Yeah. He, yeah, he doesn't do anything to try to like move you or anything like that. I, I, yeah, I agree. Totally. However, the kids got blown out 12 to one. Dude is on the ice doing a mock interview before we even start the game. Like, can we get our head into the game, please? Like, is anybody focused out here? And that is the coach's responsibility to make sure that everybody's ready to go. But still, like, these dudes got housed. Like, not even close. They're getting bodied all over the ice. Nobody's standing up for each other. I got these two goons. The kid gets kicked out three seconds into the game. Like, 
what? And then he's in the back roid raging like crazy. <laughs> that or, was great. Or, or he has some inner demons that he has to deal with because I feel like him and his other goon buddy had a little thing going on. Just so I, just so we're clear. It, I, I, there's something wrong with Portman. There's definitely something wrong with Portman. Like that's definitely like a school shooter, a future school shooter. Like if something bad happened to that guy, would anybody be like, "Whoa, I didn't see that coming"? No, they I don't see that run wild in the USC dorms. Like that is a recipe for disaster. Like what was going on with those two? Like looking at each other before they took their drink and then turned on the music to go to bed. I was like, "What are we setting this up to be?" <laughs> we don't you? Saul, do you have any male friends? Like, don't you have a, don't you have like a close guy friend? Uh, yeah, but I've never done that with them. I've mm -hmm. never been like, you ready to do this? Let's drink. And then let me turn on this, this crappy version of what was supposed to be like hardcore rock and roll. These dudes were metal heads, right? You just know that they were bangers, right? And they're playing, I forgot what the song was, but it definitely wasn't like hardcore. It's a 90s jam metal. for sure. Yeah, it was terrible. Actually, I have the name of it. So, all right, that's going to get me to a new category I want to talk to you guys about because Portman is a nominee for this. I asked you guys. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you, yes. Yeah. Oh, man. By Bachman Just, Turner Overdrive. See, I did my homework. I don't even know you anymore. <laughs> so Portman is a Portman is a front runner for a new category I want to ask every time that we do one of these podcasts. Who do you want to punch in the face in this movie? I'm giving you one character. You get a consequence-free punch to someone. Who is it? Tittles. Why Tittles? Tittles was so obnoxious. His look, his anti-athleticism, his inability to just separate from the coach and the team and only focus on money and business was so goddamn annoying i wanted him out <laughs> whoa whoa okay this is, a, this is a family show i like it a disney movie bringing out bringing you out i love it all right what do you got so you get to I mean, let's be honest i was not gonna punch a kid in the face so so yeah. oh, I'm, I'm, I'm punching the kid in the face you know, I, I, yo f them kids i'll tell you that right now i totally would have punched uh keenan right in the throat yeah absolutely like he's talking crap dude i'm on the national team and we just blew this team out 11 to nothing you stay in the stands you fat little chubby kid so he didn't your talk to you lick your butter fingers <laughs> you look at his imdb like this guy had a run this is yeah. his first movie yeah. like oh yeah. it's his first movie because then he goes and he does heavyweights he does a bunch of other movies like he's in everything uh is he in Good Good Burger? I think like he has just a yep. run, which started on but, Nickelodeon, and that's where they that's where yeah. his him and uh, his buddy like just completely took off. And then obviously we see where he's at on it. Keenan and Kel, I was very much a part of the Keenan and Kel era. Yeah, that seems like you would be. Oh so my god, you would punch Keenan? Wow, I, I yeah. did not see that coming. But he he was kind of mouthy up in the stands. I, yeah, I picked and another. He couldn't, even, he couldn't even avoid a triple team. The pudgy kid, come on now. <laughs> Why do you gotta body shame him? Well, because he was a sh he was a shit talker, of course. All right, Kelly. My, my punch is uh, Robertson. I don't know his first name. He's the cowboy. He brings a lasso, and he lassos a dude on the team. Like everywhere they go, I mean, they're in Los Angeles, and he's dressed like so cowboy, like he's uh, doing cosplay of a cowboy. And I don't know why this movie treads on a lot of stereotypes. We're going to probably get into that a little bit. Actually, we, let's get into that. But yeah. for some reason, Cowboy just drove me crazy. I love oh. Texas people, but this was like too much Texas. Like I like anybody who's into things. Yeah, you like Harry Potter. That's great. Like, but you, you know, you name your kids like Muggle or whatever. Like, that's too much. It's too much. I just and think this. Is lot Sorry, go ahead. No, right. I just, it's too much, too much cowboy. And like, he just, he was not serious at all. There's no way that dude makes the team. Like the Minnesotans would not, would not take that dude in. So I, I'm giving Robertson like a solid uppercut. 
I just think there's a lot of irony that they found a lot of kids playing hockey in warm weather cities. I know they're trying to push that a lot nationally, I guess, but you got the Miami kid, you got the San Francisco kid, you got the LA kid, you got the Austin, Texas kid. Like what? No, Yeah, like, <clears throat> I'm sorry. That ain't oh. happening. And then, and then of all things, you have the ducks, which should be in Minnesota in the national hockey league. The Anaheim ducks should actually be in Minnesota where this movie all took place. And the stars should be in LA in Anaheim. Why haven't we done this? Why haven't we swapped those two? That, that doesn't make any sense. Mm, that's good. Well, this, yeah, this, obviously this movie came out when the Dallas North stars, I think it's in the first movie, they go to a North stars game and they're playing the Hartford Whalers, and then both teams went on to move. And obviously the North Stars go down to Dallas, become the Dallas Stars, and Anaheim gets an expansion team. This movie came out in 1992. Disney gets an NHL franchise in 1993. They name them the Mighty Ducks. Uh, the, the In the first movie, they're wearing like the classic green throwbacks. In this movie, they go and they put on the Timu Selene era, you know, uh, 19 early 1990s. Uh, it's it's Timu Selene. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. <laughs> but um, yeah, so how do we feel about uh, how do we feel about South Central LA and the it's the Disneyfication of South Central LA? I'm obviously looking at Saul. I don't know. Kristen, I don't know here. where that is. <laughs> no, I'm like. Okay, first of all, I'm from San Francisco. I lived in LA, and the two kids that they point out where they're from on screen, they go, the black kids from South Central. Then they go up to the Asian kid, and he's from San Francisco. And I'm like, bro, yo, watching a '90s movie in 2021 does it hurts. something for you. Does something for you. I just feel like Keaton's character was probably the same kid in Boys in the Hood that was like. Y'all want to see a dead body? And so they just came from seeing that dead body, and now they're playing street hockey on this ledge somewhere in the city. That ain't happening. That is not happening in South Central. I don't even think I've ever seen anything resembling something like that in South no. Central, ever. So Venice Beach, they're not They're not playing. And what beach is Bombay fake figure skating around where there's nobody on the beach? Nobody. It's completely empty. It's a big beach. I'm like, what part of the beach is that? Because I'd like to go chill by myself there too. Yeah. Oh yeah, the sad, the sad, dejected, cliche. You got to have the sad moment before the comeback, oh, which yeah. takes us from beautiful Southern California over to one of my favorite places in the podcast, and that is Cliche Hell. <laughs> this movie uh, is not just a; it's a propagator of many. This thing is like right in the heart of like stereotypical sports movies what did you guys see we talked about uh, announcers everywhere what other of the major sports cliches stuck out to you guys i have a long list laundry oh, so list do so do i go ahead all right so yeah broadcasters it comes down to the big game at the end we have the old guru of no which is apparently his dad or something who's gonna you know re-inspire his his coaching career um why does the team that you're supposed to like always have to be the misfits? Like, why do they always have to be ragtag? Like, why can they not just be the ones who are put together and organized? Right, right. Like, why can't they be Iceland? You know what I mean? Right, just I'm a like, bunch of, like forbid this team is disciplined and strong, you know? Yeah, that's why everybody gets a medal nowadays, because they all look at movies like this and they're like, oh, we can win it all too. No, you can't. You just can't. Right? But you guys don't. You guys don't want like the cinematic version of like the dream team. You want like, the, like that's what you guys want to see. Like just the good team that kicks everybody's ass. But like Disney would make the movie about like Angola and how they like hung within like 70 points of the dream team in 1992. Exactly. Yeah. That's the Disney movie people don't want to see. Yes. <laughs> I have a bad guy with slick back hair. <laughs> oh yeah. There's always a slick back hair bad guy. Uh, the Foreigner dentist was... who, by the way, modeled himself after Pat Riley, and he did look quite a bit Pat Riley-like in that. Yep. And then uh, the foreigner who, with remarkably great English, like no accent whatsoever, this guy, you know, he just kind of talked a little slow. That's it. That's all he did. Uh, person who gets popular and forgets the little people then realizes he really does need them. Yeah, the internal, <laughs> the internal conflict. And then how, how come every Disney movie is like this? 
where you have a sports movie and they do this, you know, they haven't trained very much through this whole time, but right before the big game, oh, we're going to do all these drills and we're going to train and we're going to practice. And all of a sudden we're going to be so much better than we used to be. You only had like a day in between the game. Like how much better could you have possibly gotten? All of a sudden the kid from Miami who doesn't know how to stop learns how to stop. It's a miracle. They also did the unconventional training thing where it was like the night before the big game, they did the beach ball, which I feel like you usually get like, Oh, all of a sudden let's stop what's doing what's working for us. And let's do something wacky. So yeah. Also, uh, let's, let's not ignore the love interest here. That they, the the teen educator just happens to be a young single woman that they just drop right in front of the coach. And she um, I, also, her canceling practice, she'd have been fired for that. <laughs> especially, especially considering she was hired by the sponsor. Like, oh, you're just going to cancel practice? These kids just got molly whopped 12 to 1 by Iceland. <laughs> like, you're canceling practice? Get the hell out of here. Nope. I got a couple of I got a couple of other cliches. Um, I love when movies do this. The assembling of the team, picking them up, doing various things along the way. Armageddon is like a classic version of this, but basically like any movie from like the Dirty Dozen, the Magnificent Seven, like you always gotta find like your demolition experts doing one thing, somebody's at a casino. You know, they did Ocean's Eleven, it's like a great <laughs> version of that. That should be a sports movie. Is robbery a sport? Maybe it is. Gambling should be a sport. But yeah, the assembling of the team, <laughs> the assembling of the team early on, I think is just a great classic sports movie cliche. They're never just already hanging out. They all got to be doing their abstract things. And obviously, really, they, you, you really think in that whole, you know, montage scene where they're putting the whole team together during that 43 mile rollerblading, uh, Goldberg was going to be able to hang halfway through that? <laughs> you really believe this? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, this one also has this happens in a lot of sports movies. There's really no reason for it, but there's a dance scene. This one is on ice, but they dance. They had like, uh, what? Oh, is this where they dance to what was this? Wump, there it is, or is that's another scene that they use? Wump, there it is. But there is like a totally irrational dance scene in this movie where they're like they're dancing on the ice. And please, people, <laughs> if you're watching this movie again, I beg of you to look for this part. Emilio Estevez is totally half-assing through this dance scene. Like, I, it's very rare that I could like tell what's happening off camera, and you just know, you just know this dude's like, I'm in Young Guns. Why am I dancing with 14 year olds on the ice? Like, I just I saw him and I felt his pain, and I <laughs> hope that when you watch this again, you feel his pain during that dance. It's scene. when they're doing. It's when the Cowboys teaching him how to to two step, isn't it? There you go. You're right. Yeah, you're right. This does, by the way, it does, yeah, and one there it is, is in the soundtrack. And I think this is probably like the end and high watermark for a very good classic 90s banger, but it is in this movie. It belongs in the movie. Um, another major cliche, and I'm going to get into this, but it has the improbable comeback, which I think, I think we should actually say when a movie doesn't have the improbable comeback, but they're down four to one in Iceland. Iceland is virtually unbeatable. And then, I want to give this movie credit because I think we're haters sometimes on this podcast. I'm mostly talking to Kristen and a little bit to Saul, but I, I'm going to say something. I think the hockey in this movie is really good. I think the use of sound effects and a lot of stunt doubles and, you know, say what you want about some of the specific plays, but I think the action on the ice, like the last game is very long in this movie. And, and probably too long, but I do. What did you guys think about the hockey? Like we don't talk a lot about the actual sport itself other than, you know, Rocky Ford, bad boxing, but I think the hockey in this is good for a lot of these movies with kid actors. I think it's good. It was believable. I still don't believe that that cast of characters was pulling off this level of hockey, but the nerdy redhead with the glasses. You don't think he's like a stud Pete hockey player. Yeah. Still not buying that one. Yeah, no. And yeah, I mean, I didn't. I didn't notice how bad it was. I'll say that. Yeah. So that's that's good. I mean, it was it was a move in the right direction. I also think it was kind of a D move for Coach Bombay to put the the female goaltender in there for the most crucial goal of the entire game. Like she's so cold, she has no idea what's about to happen, and he's just positive. I can tell you exactly what to do so you don't f this up, and she does. But man. 
in real life, that's setting her up for failure. That's not I, cool. thought that, I thought they just put her in to be a distraction. I thought no, they behind a hockey mask, behind a hockey mask, and like yeah, you know, no. thirty pounds of hockey gear. I mean, where do you yeah. think they were like and he, and he's, checking and, around? And the dude's like forty feet away when he starts. Like he just laughs at her. He's like, oh, "Yeah, I got this." Nah. I actually think that the sequel to this would have been, you know, they did D three, which I'm not all that interested in, but it would have been interesting if she had blown the game and then like the fallout from that. Because yeah, like why did you put her in? It's kind of like when a college team is. I, it, maybe it's like this when a college team is playing a much better team and they come within like the extra point at the end and they decide to go for two because, you know, you're probably not winning the extension of the game. So maybe it was like, Hey, let's give this girl a chance. It's a cooler story if she wins and we're probably not going to win anyway. I don't know. Ah, uh, I don't know. I, I guess. That was good as mine. <laughs> yeah. It's not a good sequel. I know that. So, um let's let's go with that let's uh or actually let, let me change our here um hall of fame quotes mm. a, a, i'm i'm curious what you guys think i was having trouble quoting a lot of this movie but the one thing that has stuck out through me for me throughout the years is the knuckle puck which isn't a particularly good quote but i definitely remember that being like an important part of the plot but what what quotes do you have? And I have one that's absolutely going in the Hall of Fame, but what did you guys write down? I don't have anything. There was nothing quotable to me in this movie. Yeah, is any... I, I mean, maybe maybe these quotes make honorable mention. I don't know if they're going in the Hall of Fame. Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's a handful of different things. You know, how do you say wussy in Italiano? Again, going with some stereotypes... Um, there, there is a handful of things that I think are, um, you lost it for me. You lost it for yourself. You know, the Icelander says back to his coach, but there's a, there's a quote I want to put in the hall of fame here. And I'm dedicating this to you, Kristen McDougald. I know what it is then. Oh. <laughs> it has to be. I'm no lady. I'm a duck. <laughs> I, I just, oh, I love you out on the mean streets of Eugene, Oregon, as we've learned on this show, punching guys at bars, someone getting fresh with your friend, somebody, you know, it happened. bonding with some variation of like, hey lady, you know, move over. And you respond with, I'm no I'm lady. No lady. I'm, a I'm a duck. That was a good one. I'll put that in the hall of fame for sure. It, for us, it absolutely belongs. Um, I have some good hypothetical questions we're going to get into, but I'm going to lead into that with who would you guys give your sixth man or sixth woman, because we're woke, sixth man or sixth woman, sixth person, you know, really, you can go any, there's there's really only one disqualification that Emilio can't be at. Other than that, we're pretty much talking about an ensemble movie, so Best performance, most memorable, most important, you know, who, who would you guys hand yours to? The D2 sixth man. I'd actually give it to Tibbs. Oh, my God. I would. I actually enjoyed him because I felt like he was like a friendly guy and I thought he was going to turn bad. But he was really just like, dude, you can't get blown out 12 to 1. Otherwise, we're ripping the sponsorship away. Anyway, have a good night. And he walked away. That was really the only bad guy moment he had. Otherwise, he was in full support of the team. And so, like, I liked him. Mm. Well, you and I are clearly sitting on different benches then because I punched him in the face already well, earlier. It's because you're a duck and I'm a wildcat. So, of course, we're sitting on different benches. Who's, who, who's your person? My my person, I, I don't. I don't remember his name. The one who gave up his roster spot at the end of the movie. He gave up his oh. roster spot so that the team could go win. Are those the two brothers? Is that Josh Jackson? You got the Banks. Are they Banks brothers, right? Is Adam Banks and... I'm not sure. But that was an MVP move right there. It was sixth man award move. Like, ultimate taken one for the team. He knew that he was the weakest link. And apparently everyone else knew he was the weakest link too because they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, come on, come coach. So my my sixth person is going to lead um, into uh, 
a, a hypothetical question, and I'm giving it to Connie. Connie is the one of two girls on the team. I believe she's from the first movie, not the one that was from Banger Maine. But speaking of Banger, uh, Marguerite Moreau is the actress who played Connie. And there's a quote from her that I'm going to read to you where she says, this is in a retrospect about the making of this movie. I cannot confirm or deny that I may have kissed two or three or maybe even five of them, her co-stars. I was 15. It was a very exciting time for me. I mean, it's a very flattering attention for a little while, you know? So on this show right now, who did not get kissed? If five of them got kissed, I want to know which guys. And Kristen, you're going to have to help me out here. Oof. I mean, this. if you read that quote and you were an actor in that movie and you know you're not one of the five, I'm going to tell you, someone who's a late bloomer, that stings a lot. Uh, Goldberg definitely did not get kissed. Goldberg, okay. Did, did not get kissed. The redhead, he's out. The redhead is out. Wow. Hey, you got a thing against redheads. Wait, 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 hold on. Did she say it was five of the the teammates or just five members of the? I, I think she's referring to five ducks, five, five. five members of Team USA. And it's not oh, necessarily no. five guys. <laughs> oh, true. <laughs> well, now we're on to something. <laughs> we can't, yay, we got to be woke here. Wow. Everybody's equal opportunity to around this piece. Well, the formation of the flying V is taking a whole nother turn for me. Oh my god! Well, that's our last. That's our last of our podcast. We will. You know, hey, John, the I, I might the the little guy from San Francisco, the figure skater. I'm thinking he's too little for Connie. I'm not a. I'm not a sizeist, but as someone who is the littlest person in my grade, I don't. Uh, there was no one interested in me that was uh, because all the girls were larger. So I'm thinking you could mark him off the list. Josh Jackson definitely on the list. Josh Jackson, super hot, you know, way before he was what party of five guy or whatever. He was definitely, he's definitely like a nineties kid hunk. The two blondies definitely got kissed. I feel like this was probably, you know, the in sync backstreet boys era and blonde hair would have just been the obvious choice for Connie. Any, and, e either one of the two goons get kissed? Portman, definitely. Portman is a good-looking guy. And I, I, I got to actually look up how old he was, uh, Aaron Actually, I, I think Connie found her way to the opposing bench, and I think she kissed yeah, definitely. someone on Ice, my in, in Icelander. Yeah, because they were a little bit – they look to be a little bit older, a little bit taller, more muscles. Like, that's obvious. You know what's crazy is Portman, I looked it up, he was like 17 when they shot this movie, but this he looks like the type of guy that was like 27 playing a 17-year-old, and mm -hmm. yeah. that's how I felt about like every person in high school that had like a mustache, and I was like, cool, I just want my voice to change. So <laughs> I, I, I definitely have like Portman got some, issues. Got some PTSD going on today in this episode. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, I got some more questions for you guys before we can uh, wrap this up here. Um, something about the hockey were you excited when they scored the game tying goal? This is after the flying V and all that. Were you excited when they scored the game tying goal as a viewer here in 2021? Or are you dead inside? Oh, you know the answer to that one. Do you even have to ask me? Saul's dead. Yes, very much so. Mm, you just so, knew it was congr coming. Congratulations for doing your job. Shouldn't have been down to that to begin with with all the training wow. you did right before the game. Yeah. Stopping on a dime. Don't knock over those aluminum cans. <laughs> Can't have that now. Oh. How to learn okay, to stop we... when you're on the national team. All right. Well, we, we started with an easy one. This one right? started. Yes. That's a great point. This kid couldn't stop, yet he's on the U.S. national team. What? For the Goodwill Games. All right. Well, and Keenan like talked his way onto the team like two thirds of the way through the tournament. So you know, again, it's Disney. It's Disney, okay? 
You're they're, like, you know, they're, they're giving all the wrong messaging to kids. Like, come on, I, it. You don't get on the national team because you just show up. You have to put in the work. You have to know what the hell you're doing, and you have to be better than the other guys. And none of these players were. You can't show up like this is like a last minute exam the night before and start studying. Like that's just not how this goes in the athletic world. All right. You have to go out there every single day. That's what, that's what's wrong with some kids nowadays is they just think, Oh, tryouts are on Monday, Sunday night. I'm gonna go shoot some hoops. Cause I want to make the team. That's not how this works. Also, mind you, this is hockey, where in the modern era, some of these NHL players are full on 18 years old. So that would have been two, three years away from where these kids were. Totally unrealistic. And none of these kids are going pro. We know that. Going pro in different entertainment industries. <clears throat> Connie. Damn. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. Maybe that's D3. Where everything <laughs> <goes down. laughs> what, what does the D stand for? <laughs> We've completely gone off the rails on this one. We got flying V. We, we, and promise, and... we promise it's a kid's movie. That's we, true. We you know, I actually did have an issue with the title. I didn't quite understand D2. And now I think we understand what D2 stood for. So, oh, my gosh. I, I, all right. That was an easy question. We led to that one. This one gets harder. And this, this is from something that Kristen had texted us about. But who is prettier in this movie, the Iceland trainer or Emilio Estevez? Oh, the Iceland trainer. I don't know. Emilio with those blue eyes. That's, that's all he has is blue eyes. That hair is way too big. It's way too poofy. It's It needs to be trimmed up. It needs to be cleaned up. And he's like kind of, for a guy who allegedly was supposed to be like right there on the, the cusp of the NHL, he sure is out of shape, in my opinion. He was just so... Blah. Yeah, he, he was nothing impressive about this performance by Emilio Estevez, I got to say. So, yeah, like, I mean, they made sequels to this because they made a lot of money. I mean, I think the first one made $45 million. This one made $50 million. They made a third one that he's barely in. But it, it's weird to me that they, like, bet on Emilio Estevez in this. That, like, they thought, like, that's the reason. We got to have him back. I don't know what you no. could have done. I guess you're sort of pot committed, but. I feel like he would be um, well cast in like a lifetime movie or something. You know, he's he, there and he's just, he's very uh unoffending if that if if I can say that. You know, like there's nothing about him that's going to, you know, he's just kind of very average. He's very kind of blah. He's got beautiful blue eyes, yes, but that's about the only thing. So so who would you want? Who do you want in this role? Ooh, for Coach okay. Bombay? Yeah. Um, well, since we're going to the inner city to get all these kids, I'll take Samuel L. Jackson to be the head coach. How about that? How about like um well, I'll stick in the inner city. How about like uh no. No. How about like a what about like a Jamie Foxx? You you guys are definitely going with like the karate kid reboot. Like it's like the karate kid, but Everyone's black. Is that what we're doing right now? No. <laughs> that was Last Dragon, dude. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> you just need someone with a little bit more swagger, I think. See, like, I, like, like Team USA, we're talking about. I mean, I think there's a couple of ways you could go with it. I, I'm like, just give me a funnier guy, like a little athleticism. I, I'm thinking like, like Owen Wilson or something. I would take a guy that would be kind of funny, you know, voice. Of, oh, Vince no? Vaughn would be good. Vince Vaughn would Vince be Vaughn. good. Vince Vaughn. Yeah, no, he, I don't think I that. Vince Vaughn could go from zero to a hundred, and you, could you imagine him in that in that scene post game when they got blown out twelve to one? There's no like, oh, you guys are letting me down, and you're letting yourselves down, and no, he'd be like, "The hell's wrong with you guys?" You know, he'd be like very energetic about it, very passionate. You got to have that. Yeah, you need passion. You co the coach needs passion, but I, I'm not messing with that humor. Like you throw Vince Vaughn on screen, and I'm waiting for like the you know, fart joke or something. <laughs> Which is um, terrible, by the way. I, I, th I don't think it'd be like too funny because if it's too funny, like if a guy that wants to be the center of the attention all the time, you end up with like Will Ferrell kicking and screaming. That's like a kid movie where the coach is maybe like too over the top. But mm -hmm. um, all right. So before we let's, so about Emilio Estevez, one of the reasons that I wanted to do this movie on the podcast is, 
Disney Plus is bringing it back. Did you guys watch the trailer? What do we think about the new incarnation of uh, the Mighty Ducks? The Mighty Ducks Game Changers coming to Disney Plus in 2021. Do we know when it's coming out? I don't, but here's my hypothetical for you. Imagine you're Emilio Estevez. You got plenty of money, but pretty rough run, you know, as far as like if you were A-lister, you're not A-lister anymore. Disney calls you and goes like, yo, hey, we want to have you on this new series we're bringing back. Like, does he say yes right away? Does he slow play it and act like he's got a, like, I got a bunch of stuff going on? How much money so, are we talking think? about? How much money are we talking about? <clears throat> that's that's what I'm asking. How much money is at stake? You pay me a million dollars to do this? Eh, you know, maybe I got plenty of money. We're doing five to ten million in uh, each episode or movie. Okay, you got my attention now. But there's no chance he has anything else going on right now. Exactly. It's like, all right, here's his. I'm. I'm going to read you his entire IMDb from the last decade. This will take about fifteen seconds. Uh, he had an appearance in Two and a Half Men in two thousand eight. Okay, um, he's in a movie called The Way from twenty ten. He's in a short called Dear Dracula in twenty twelve. He's another TV short called Abominable Christmas in 2012. He's in The Public in 2018. Uh, and then this in 2021. So the phone's not exactly ringing off the hook. He's blocked. I'm just saying, he's I just want to know if he's like, hey, it sounds cool. Let me have my people talk it over. We'll get back in touch with your people. And then does he like, you know, hold the phone and like do a fist pump? Like if a, you know, a girl calls you that you like, you got to, he's got to play it cool, right? He played it cool is what I'm saying. We agree about that. Yeah. He's like, yes, they won't, they won't be back. So we don't have to write. Well, all right. And then, so what happens? What do we expect to see happen in this series? You know, the, the trailer is out there. It looks like a lot of the same, but what's happened to Gordon Bombay in the 23 years since we saw him in D3 oh, cashing his like last check? Yeah, it looks like he just kind of like fell off the face of the earth. Everything kind of fell apart. Now he's back working the Zamboni at the local ice rink. I'm always in for an interesting love triangle in these movies. So I yeah. think he I think he comes away with one of the two girls in the movie. <laughs> You're big. And I think dad has since passed. So he took over the shop. And... Yeah. I think it's gonna be like the same movie all over again. Like D three is gonna be D two, and they're gonna someone's gonna come in and want you know wants him to coach again, and he has to fight with his wife about it to move that, across. That kid who wanted to be a coach is probably a coach. Yeah. Yeah. You know, very. Like very. I mean, I mean, did you guys even? Let me ask you this: Did you did you like the movie? Was this a good Disney movie? As far as Disney movies go. I didn't really like it. And I've seen a lot of Disney movies. I mean, there's a lot of them out there that I do like. Right. Um, I felt like this is kind of like, meh. It, it kind of wrote I, itself after D1. I think this is like a time machine movie. It's very 90s. The soundtrack is very 90s. Like the outfits the kids are wearing look like Disney Channel 1990s stuff. The humor is very like on the nose. I think it's like a, I think it's a good kid movie that will, hold up. I mean, if I showed it to a little kid now, like we're looking at it through the prism of bitter old people, but I think a kid watching this movie would still find it like the hockey action is good, but it's not like you have to really understand hockey to know what's going on. So I think it's cool. I think, um, you know, take it from a guy who's wearing a hockey sweater for the second time in his life. I give it like a hockey thumbs up for sure. I do think that's what these movies have going for them is they are just the token hockey movies that if Disney wanted to put the resources to making a better hockey movie at some point down the line. Like they could probably have come up with a better, a better premise than this one, but it was good. It was cute. So my last question, usually we write the sequel to get out of this thing, but this is the last hypothetical question that has no great answer. I want to know who chanted ducks more, the kids in Minneapolis or Kristen in college? Oh Yeah. This girl, Kristen. Also, nothing says America more than throw your country away and put on a Ducks jersey and represent only yourself at the end of the game, like a Mighty Ducks movie. How about that? Ugh. Ducks fly together. Ducks fly together. 
did it yeah this had to give you a lot of pride did it just like did it feel like it was speaking to you the ducks well it was interesting leaving Oregon moving down to Southern California everyone would talk about the ducks I'm like nice yeah ducks Pac-12 and they're like oh no like the you know Anaheim and I'm like what the fuck who talks about the who talks about the Anaheim ducks <laughs> beep excuse me you're talking about the 2007 stanley cup champion mm. anaheim ducks yes the franchise that was created from a disney movie who uh, like, i will know the most prestigious university in all of the nation the university of oregon ducks. it was the still anaheim, the anaheim ducks who you will see a number of times on fox sports arizona as they play the 2021 season in an all West division NHL guys, final thoughts, everybody good. So D D two, we're, I don't think we're doing D three. We're not in a rush into D three, but uh, you guys pumped about hockey. Did this guys get you in the winter mood? D two hockey's back. Go ducks. We really brought that conversation full circle with uh, go watch Fox sports, Arizona now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just here so I don't get fined. So, yeah, we're good. <laughs> Guys, check out D2, the Mighty Duck sequel. You can find it on Disney+. Plus. Kristen McDougal, Saul Bookman. That is another installment of The Real MVP. Please make sure you subscribe. You fire your comments at us on YouTube. And uh, we thank you very much for listening. And we will see you next time. And mainly comment who you... Uh, you know, would punch in the face. <laughs> it's <laughs> definitely me. I think I'm definitely like Saul. They'd be afraid of. He's all like serious. I talk the most. No one's punching Kristen. <laughs>